Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff Byrne coming to you to continue our conversation about um, the Scarlet Letter. Again, I am using the Barnes & Noble Classics Edition. Um, I don't know that that really makes a huge difference, it's just the one that I happen to have on my bookshelf. Um, in this uh, chapter, I'm going to, or not this chapter, but in this video, I'm going to look at chapters 4, 5, and 6. All right. Um, and that's the interview, which is chapter four. Uh, five is Hester at her needle. And then um, the last one is Pearl. Chapter six is Pearl. All right. Um, so as always, what I would like to do is just jump right in with this. Okay. So with the interview, all right, this interview is what we're going to see is Hester has been pilloried, as we know. She's been on uh, that scaffold for three hours where people could... Uh, gawk at her, insult her, and she could just stand and look out at everyone and say, well, here I am. Yes, I've done wrong, obviously. You know, I'm an unmarried woman who has a child. Well, you know, uh, but if you remember, she would never mention uh, the husband, not the husband, but the uh, father of the child. Even when asked by the Reverend Dimsdale, point blank, in front of everybody with the magistrates above her looking down as if they were God, right? Um, and he questioned her, said, please, you know, speak and say, who is the, the father? But she wouldn't do it. She wouldn't go there. She kept her mouth shut. All right. So she has returned. When we last saw she was returning, uh, into the prison. Now she is in the prison and we have a visitor who comes and sees her. It's the interview. It's this, it's the, this person sort of, you know, asking a lot of questions and, um, expressing a lot of, you know, I guess we, we'll find that this, this person has, they have, you know, a background. And we see quickly that it is the man who was in the crowd that, you know, caught the eye, that told her, you know, Shh, don't say anything, right? Um, and uh, they seem to, you know, game recognizing game there while she was on the scaffold, all right? So let's go ahead and jump right into this. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to read probably that first full paragraph of the interview here. It says, after her return to the prison, Hester Prynne was found to be in a state of nervous excitement that demanded uh, constant watchfulness lest she should uh, per perpetrate violence on herself or do some half frenzied mischief to the poor babe. All right, so yeah, she's in such a state that like she may actually harm herself if we're not careful and don't... Uh, Pay attention to her. As night approached, uh, it proving impossible to quell her insubordination by rebuke or threats of punishment, Master Brackett, the jailer, thought fit to introduce a physician. Okay, He described him as a man of skill in all Christian modes of physical science and likewise familiar with whatever the savage people could teach in respect to medical herbs and roots that grew in the forest. I find this interesting. All right. There's the way the Puritans see medicine. All right. Then there is the way that the Native Americans uh, see and practice medicine. This person is not just the puritanical Christian viewpoint of medicine. He kind of brings them all in. And I think that's significant because what we're dealing with is not somebody who is a, I would say, a party line Christian when it comes to knowledge, seeking things, and understanding things, all right? Um, it says, to say the truth, there was much need of professional assistance, not merely for Hesser herself, but still more urgently for the child. All right, who drawing its uh, sustenance from the maternal bosom seemed to have drank, uh, drank in uh, with it all the turmoil, the anguish, and despair which pervaded the mother's system. Now uh, it now writhed in convulsions of pain and was a forcible type in this little frame of the moral agony which Hester Prynne had borne throughout the day. So it's almost as though you know, uh, since the child you know is is, you know, feeding from the mother, then just, actually, you know, took on some of her anxiety, took on some of her, uh, you know, uh, her, well, yeah, her anxiety, her fears, and her, you know, dis distress from everything that went on here, all right? 
So, you know, closely following the jailer into the uh, dismal apartment appeared that individual of singular aspect whose presence in the crowd had been of such deep interest to the wearer of the scarlet letter. It's that person, right? Um, he was lodged in the prison not as a suspect of any offense, but as the most convenient and suitable mode of disposing him until the magistrates could have uh, conferred with the Indian uh, Sagamores uh, respecting his, his ransom. His name was announced, get this, his name was announced as Roger Chillingworth. Chillingworth, all right? And you'll see that is a very fitting title for him, uh, his demeanor, and the way he, uh, you know, behaves um, in uh, regards to, you know, other people, especially uh, Hester. And we will see later as he tries to cultivate a relationship with Dimsdale. Chillingworth is, I mean... Spot on, okay? So they have a conversation, this Chillingworth and Hester, all right? Uh, and I'm going to begin uh, looking at uh, the paragraph that begins, My old studies in alchemy, observed he, and my sojourn for a, above, a past, above a year past among the people well-versed in the kindly properties of simples have made a better physician of me than many that claim the medical degree. Okay. Here, woman, the child is yours. She is none of mine. Okay, he makes that note. Neither will she recognize my voice or aspect as a father's. Administer this draft, therefore, with thine own hand. Okay, he's giving her something to give the child for the child to drink to calm her so that she's no longer writhing and no longer in pain. Hester repelled uh, the author of uh, the offered of medicine. At the same time, gazing with strongly marked apprehension into his face. She does not trust this guy at all. Wouldst thou avenge thyself on an innocent babe? Whispered he. Like, are you going to take everything out on this child? Hmm. Foolish woman, responded the physician, half uh, coldly, half soothingly. Uh, what should ail me? What, what should ail me to harm this misbegotten and miserable babe? The medicine is potent for good. And were it my child, yea, mine own, as well as thine, I could do no better for it. So if it were my child, so if it was mine as well as yours, if it was our child, but it's not, he's already made that clear, okay, I would give it to the child, all right? Um, he tries to give her something. She does not want it. She thinks it might actually be poison. You know, he says there that paragraph where it says, I, I know uh, not Leth nor uh, Nepen, Nepen, Nepthene, or whatever it is, okay? It says, drink it. It may be less soothing than a sinless conscience. That I cannot give thee, okay? So he tries to give her something to make her feel better. She doesn't want it. He says, but hang on. This drink that I'm giving you will make you feel good. As good as if you had a clean conscience, but I can't give you that now, can I? All right. So he's looking at her and, and wanting, he's, he's sort of just reveling in the fact that she's guilty, reveling in the fact that she has a guilty conscience, reveling in the fact that she has been uh, appointed and pilloried and focused on for her sinful nature. And her sinful nature is one the, the, the result of which is this child that he makes a very important point of it not being his. All right. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to begin reading again where it says, Drink then, he replied, still with the same old uh, composure. Dost thou know me so little, Hester Prynne? Are my purposes want to be so shallow? Even if I imagine a scheme of vengeance... Why would he have a scheme of vengeance, this person? What could I do better uh, for my object than to let thee live? Than to give thee medicines against all harm and peril of life, so that this burning shame may still blaze upon thy bosom? Like, there is not, it would not actually benefit me at all to kill you with something like this. There would, it would be far more satisfying for me if I tried to make you live and live a long life, because that life that you're going to live is going to be one filled with shame. That actually is a more satisfying revenge for me, all right? 
As he spoke, he laid his long forefinger on the scarlet letter, which forthwith seemed to scorch into Hester's breast as if it had been red hot. Um, he noticed her involuntary gesture and smiled. Live, therefore, and bear about thy doom uh, with thee in the eyes of men and women, in the eyes of him whom thou didst call thy husband. Mm -hmm. So she once had a husband. In the eyes of yonder child, and that thou mayest uh, live, take off this trap. So live. Live so that you can be embarrassed forever. All right. We see that next paragraph, the last sentences of that next paragraph, just who this person is, if you haven't already figured it out. I mean, I think if you're checking this, out these videos and follow me through this, you probably see what's coming a mile away. Uh, the last couple sentences says, I might have known that as I came out of the vast and dismal forest and entered this settlement of Christian men, the very first object to meet my eyes would be thyself, Hester Prynne, standing, uh, standing up, a statue, a statue of ignominy, ignominy uh, before the people. Nay, from the moment when we came down the old church steps together, a married uh, pair, I might have beheld the bale fire of that scarlet letter blazing at the end of our path. Oh, so this is her husband she once had. And he says to her, oh, you know, when we were together... I should have known that something like this might end up with us, okay? You might end up in this particular place, as though he kind of suspected something was wrong, okay? Thou knowest, says Hester, for depressed as she was, uh, she could not endure this last quiet stab at the token of her shame. Thou knowest that I was frank with thee. I felt no love, nor feigned any. So she's admitting that even though they were married, she actually never loved him. Skipping a paragraph, says, I have greatly wronged thee, murmured Hester. We have wronged each other, answered he. Mine was the first wrong when I betrayed thy budding youth into a false and unnatural relation with my decay. All right? I didn't let you, you weren't able to live out your youthfulness. I took you into my place and you, you know, you, you, you never were able to become, um, enjoy uh, the single life, a Puritan's single life, whatever that may be. Therefore, as a man who has not thought and philosophized in vain, I seek no vengeance, plot no evil against thee. Between thee and me, the scale hangs fairly balanced. All right. But Hester, the man lives who has wronged us both. Who is he? Who's the father of this child? Who did you sleep with and commit adultery with, even though we weren't married still? Okay. Ask me not, replied Hester Prynne, looking firmly into his face. Thou shalt never know. Never sayest thou, rejoined he with a smile of dark and self-relying intelligence. Never know him. Believe me, Hester, there are few things, whether... Uh, in the outward world or to a certain depth in the invisible sphere of thought, few things hidden from the man who devotes himself earnestly and unreservedly to the solution of a mystery. Thou mayest cover up thy secret from the prying multitude. Thou mayest conceal it too from the ministers and magistrates, even as thou didst this day when they sought to wrench the name out of thy heart and give thee a partner on the pedestal. But as for me, I come to the inquest with other senses than they possess. I shall seek this man as I have sought truth in books, as I have sought gold in alchemy. There is a sympathy that will make me conscious of him. I shall see him tremble. I shall feel myself shudder suddenly and unawares. Sooner or later, he must needs be mine. I will stop at nothing. I'm smarter. I'm keener. I'm not caught up by all these Christian uh, parameters. As you can see, I've been living with Native Americans in the woods, learning from them. It does not matter to me. I will stop at nothing to find out who this person is that you slept with, that knocked you up, all right, whom you are for some reason hiding his identity. 
I will not sleep. All right. You can see he says it again. Uh, not the less he shall be mine. All right. And we see that as he goes on, he just continues his scheming of trying to figure out exactly who this person is. And he will, rest, he will not rest until he figures it out. All right. So that's what this interview is about. It's about who did this and to assure her that he's going to, fi to figure it out. All right. So there you go. That is the interview. Okay, let's uh, move on into chapter five, Hester at her needle. Okay, and as we remember, um, you know, she adorned that um, scarlet letter, that A on her chest with all types of, you know, fanciful, uh, stylistic embroidery and things like that. Uh, and we find out that she is actually quite talented more talented than most people at making things like this at her needle and she you know makes a pretty desirable product that even though she is ignoble in her own way because she has been outed in this way they still want her work and they still want to um you know have what she is able to create better than anybody else. All right, so it's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, paradox with this. Okay, so let's take a look here. Uh, at the very beginning, um, I'm going to begin reading. It says Hester, Hester Prynne's term of confinement was now at end. All right, um, her prison door was thrown open, and she came forth into the sunshine, which, uh, falling on all alike, seemed to uh, seemed to her uh, sick and morbid heart as if meant for no other purpose than to reveal the scarlet letter in her breast. So now that she's free, now that she does not have to be in prison anymore, she is in the, she can, you know, walk around free in the bright sunlight. But the thing is, while she does that, that just exposes that thing, that, that symbol more obviously. All right. So this freedom comes with a price. Perhaps there was uh, a more real uh, torture uh, in her first unattended footsteps from the thres threshold of the prison than even in the procession and spectacle that have been described, where she was made the common infamy at which all mankind was summoned to point its finger. All right? So, yeah, that's it. Like, I can see you now. You are exposed. There's no way for you to hide it. All right? So it's almost like this is, this is strangely or somehow one way to look at it may be gone from bad to worse. Okay? It says midway through that she must either sustain and carry it forward by uh, the ordinary resources of nature or sink beneath it. She's got to do one. She's got to overcome this scarlet letter or it's going to bury her. All right. So she's got she's got to figure out how she's going to do it. All right. Uh, towards the end. No, actually not towards the end. Well, yeah. A few sentences before the end of that paragraph. It says um, throughout them all. Giving up her individuality, she would become the general symbol at which the preacher and moralist might point, and in which they might vivify and embody their image of women's frailty and sinful passion. She's going to become a symbol for all those negative things. All right? Thus, the young and pure would be taught to look at her with a scarlet letter flaming on her breast, and her at her the child of honorable parents, at her the mother of a babe that would here, uh, hereafter be a woman, at her who had once been innocent as the figure, the body, the reality of sin. As if she is going to represent for the people and for, you know, to teach their own children, she is the embodiment of sin. All right, that's a pretty extreme way to look at that. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, also, the very last sentence of that next paragraph. The chain that had bound her here was of iron links and galling to her inmost soul, but could never be broken. So you see what's going to happen is she can leave if she wants, but she's not. She's going to remain in Boston. She's going to find herself a cottage sort of on the outskirts of Boston in between the wild sea and this very Puritan um, city, okay, run by these Puritanical laws, all right? So she's going to be kind of right in the middle, 
all right? And she feels caught in the middle, all right? So her, her cottage is going to be right in the middle. It's gonna, that's sort of the symbolic nature of this, all right? She, her, her cottage is right here. The wild sea is out there. The wild sea that's just tumultuous, okay? And, um, you know, churning with all kinds of things, as if, you know, whatever was churning inside her, the passions that were churning inside her, and then this very legalistic, law-driven, theocratic, puritanical Boston, all right? The last uh, few sentences of that same uh, paragraph says here, she said to herself, had been the scene of her guilt, and here should be the scene of her earthly punishment. And so perchance the torture of uh, her daily shame would at length purge her soul and work out another purity than that which it had lost, more saint-like because the result of martyrdom. Hester Prynne, therefore, did not flee. All right, that's, a, that, that's saying a lot. That's, that's speaking a little bit to the fortitude of this, of her character. All right, um, about midway through the paragraph, um, we see, you know, the paragraph that begins, uh, lonely was, uh, lonely as Hester, Hester's situation, okay, and without a friend on earth. All right, I want to read a little passage here to uh, discuss Hester uh, and her needlework, her abilities as far as a seamstress go. It's going to begin, deep ruffs, painfully wrought bands, and gorgeously embroidered gloves were all deemed necessary to the official, to the official state of men, assuming the reins of power and were readily allowed to individuals dignified by rank or wealth, even while uh, sumptuary laws forbade these and similar extravagances to the plebeian order. All right, so high-ranking people were to have these certain adornments, all right? In the array of funerals, too, whether for the apparel of the dead body or to typify by manifold uh, emblematic devices of sable cloth and snowy lawn, the sorrow, uh, the sorrow of the survivors. There was a frequent and characteristic demand for such labor as Hester Prynne could supply. Baby linen for babies uh, when wore robes uh, of state afforded still another poss possibility of toil and uh, em emolument. By degrees, nor very slowly, her handiwork became what would now be termed the fashion. So what Hester Prynne could do, what she could create through her needlework was the most fashionable, right? So she's awful. We don't want anything to do with her. We're going to point to her and, and mention that she is, you know, the embodiment of sin. But man, she sure does good work. Wow. We got to have it. We got to have what she can do, right? So, whether from commiseration for a woman of so miser miserable a destiny or from the morbid curiosity that gives fictitious value even to, uh, to common or worthless things or by whatever other intangible circumstance was then as now sufficient to bestow on some persons that others might seek in vain or because Hester really filled a gap which must otherwise have remained vacant, it is certain that she had ready and fairly uh, requited employment for as many hours as she saw fit to occupy with her needle. She had more, all the work she could ever want, all right? She could even turn things down, okay? Vanity, it may be, uh, chose to uh, mortify itself by putting on for ceremonials of pomp and state the garments that had been wrought by her sinful hands. Her needlework was seen on the ruff of the governor. Military men wore it on their scarves and the minister on his band. It decked the baby bottle's cap. It was shut up to the mildewed and molder away um, in the coffins of the dead. But it is not recorded this is important, that in a single instance, her skill was called in aid to embroider the white veil, which was to cover the pure blushes of a bride. The exception uh, indicated the ever relentless vigor of which society frowned upon her sin. So for all purposes, almost, she was, her work was desirable, except when it came to weddings. Nope. All right. She's damaged goods as far as any of that is concerned. All right. Um, 
We will see here, this is in the paragraph that says continually in a thousand other ways, that particular paragraph, towards the end of that paragraph. It says that she could scarcely refrain, yet always did refrain from covering the symbol with her hand. All right? She always, she felt like she wanted to cover it up, but she never did. But then again, an accustomed eye had likewise its own anguish to inflict. Its cool stare of familiarity was intolerable. From first to last, in short, Hester Prynne had always this dreadful agony in feeling a human eye upon her token. The spot never grew callous. It seemed, on the contrary, to grow more sensitive with daily uh, torture. All right. So she was always constantly aware, constantly aware, almost like she never like got to where it was like, yeah, yeah, I, I know. All right. That's I'm over it now. No, that luxury never came to her. It was always something that was a point of pain. All right. Okay. So there we go. That's Hester the Needle. They love her work. They don't love her. All right. But um, so, you know, they can use her when they feel it's appropriate, but it's not always appropriate. All right. So there you go. All right. Last chapter for this video, chapter six, which is Pearl. What we find Pearl is the name that Hester gives the child. All right. Pearl. Pearl is, you know, it's beautiful. You know, Pearl is of, a, you know, great value. All right. And we see just how much um, this child is valuable and, you know, well, how much this child, think about it, how much this child has cost her. Okay. She comes at a pretty great price, as it says. All right. So I'm going to begin reading about midway through that first paragraph. It says, Pearl, as being of great price, purchased with all she had. Yes. Her mother's only treasure. How strange indeed. All right. Man had marked, this is interesting. Man had marked this woman's sin by a scarlet letter. That one that's, you know, just mentioned, it still was tender under there when they stared at it. But man had marked this woman's sin by a scarlet letter, which had such potent and disastrous efficacy that no human sympathy could reach her, save it were sinful like herself. Game recognizing game. Only the sinful came to her and recognized it. But God, this is interesting, man gave her that token. God, as a direct consequence, consequence of the sin, which man thus punished, had given her a lovely child. Hmm. All right. That's interesting. Whose place was, uh, whose place was on that same dishonored bosom to, uh, connect her parent forever with the race and descent of mortals and had finally been blessed soul in heaven, a blessed soul in heaven. All right. Man gives her this horrible thing. God gives her a gorgeous child. Interesting. And we're going to learn about this child. We're going to learn about Pearl in here, okay? She's a very interesting child, to say the least, all right? And it's going to be hard for her to develop. Think about it. It's hard for this child to develop because, well, who's, who's going to let their kid play with the offspring of the sinner lady, all right? She's the, you know, Hester's ostracized. Well, the offspring, what comes, you know, what came from that sin well, I don't want my kid playing with that. I don't want my kid around that type of thing. All right. So, you know, she's going to have to develop in her own way. It says, uh, these thoughts affected Hester Prynne less with hope than apprehension. She knew that her deed had been evil. She could have no, uh, she could have no faith, therefore, that, th that its result would be for good. Day after day, she looked fearfully into the child's expanding nature, ever dreading to, um, to detect some dark, arid, wild peculiarity that should correspond with the guilt, uh, guiltiness uh, to which she owed her being. Okay. All right. So the next paragraph, there's a little bit here I want to read to you because I think it's important. It begins, so magnificent was the small figure, this pearl, when thus arrayed, and such was the splendor of Pearl's own proper beauty, shining through the gorgeous robes which might have extinguished a paler lo loveliness, that there was an absolute circle of radiance around her on the dark, uh, darksome cottage floor. And yet, a russet gown, and uh, spoiled with the child's rude play, made a picture of her just as perfect. 
Pearl's aspect was imbued with a spell of infinite variety. In this one child, there were many children. Okay, I'm talking about this personality. Okay, uh, comprehending the full scope between the wildflower prettiness of a peasant baby and the pomp and little of an infant princess. Throughout all, however, there was a trait of passion, a certain depth of hue, which she never lost. And if, in any uh, of her changes, she had grown fainter or paler, she would have ceased to be herself. It would have been no longer Pearl. All right? So this radiant child, this beautiful child. And it says in here, um, there was a trait of passion in her. Well, she is her mom's daughter, right? Okay? The apple sure don't fall too far from the tree, it would appear. Uh, would appear. Okay? A pear. Pear tree. Anyway. Um, that was an accidental um, bit of pun. All right. Um, so it's interesting, too, that Pearl has a hard time with rules. Hmm. All right. Maybe she comes by that a little bit naturally, too. All right. The next paragraph uh, you will see um, about, you know, couple sentences in, it says the child could not be made amenable to rules. Jumping down a little bit, it says, the mother's impassioned state had uh, been the medium through which, the, uh, through which were transmitted to the unborn infant the rays of its moral life. And however white and clear originally, they had taken the deep stains of crimson and gold, uh, the fiery luster, the black shadow, and the untempered light of the intervening substance. Above all, the warfare of Hester's, Hester's spirit at that epoch had, was perpetuated in Pearl. Okay, so all the passions that, that Hester experienced while she was committing adultery in that type of person, well, that now. In the same way, remember that Hester uh, was stressed in you know a couple chapters ago, and um, that... Uh, as she was, you know, feeding Pearl, that kind of went into uh, Pearl and made Pearl writhing and moaning and think. Well, it's the same type of thing. She was conceived in this passionate uh, relationship, and now that she has taken that in for herself is what the text says here. Okay. She could recognize her wild, desperate, defiant mood the flightiness of her temper, and even some of the very cloud shapes of gloom and despondency that had brooded in her heart. So basically Hester is recognizing uh, a bit of her own self in this child. All right. Towards the end there, it says Hester Prynne, nevertheless, the lonely mother of this one child ran little risk of erring on the side of undue severity. Okay, so she wasn't a harsh uh, punisher of... Um, Pearl. Mindful, however, of her own errors and misfortunes, she early sought to impose a tender but strict control over the infant's immor immortality that was uh, committed to her charge. But the task was beyond her skill. Like, she wasn't really able to be a, I don't know, for lack of better terms, a hard ass. Okay? After testing both smiles and frowns and proving that neither, made, uh, neither mode of treatment possessed any calculable influence, Hester was ultimately compelled to stand aside and permit the child to be swayed by her own impulses. All right. So Pearl's just developing as Pearl would without any influence. All right. Uh, let's see. A little bit later, um, we see, you know, uh, it says the paragraph that begins, how soon? With what strange rapidity indeed did Pearl arrive at an age that was capable of social intercourse? Like she would got to the, you know, where she wasn't an infant anymore, but she could actually have friends. She could have play dates, as it were, all right? Uh, she could have, she was capable of social intercourse beyond her mother's um, ever ready smile and nonsense words. And then what a happiness would it have been could Hester Prynne have heard her clear bird-like voice mingling with the uproar of uproar of other children's voices and have distinguished and un unraveled her own darling's tones amid the entangled outcry of a group of sportive children. But this could never be. Pearl was a born outcast of the uh, infantile world, an imp of evil, an imp of evil, they considered this child. Okay? Emblem and product of sin. She had no right among Christ, uh, christened infants. Nothing was more remarkable than the instinct, 
as it seemed, with which the child comprehended her loneliness, the destiny that had drawn an invi inviolable uh, circle around her, the whole peculiarity, in short, of her position and respect to other children. Pearl would have loved for Pearl to have a normal childhood, to be able to play with other kids, but it just wasn't going to happen. She was the offspring and therefore the embodiment of sin. All right. Continuing on, it says, If the children gathered about her, as they sometimes did, Pearl would grow positively terrible in her puny wrath, snatching up stones to fling at them. So she threw stones at the other kids, okay, because she just couldn't control her outrage. With shrill, incoherent exclamations that made her mother tremble because they had so much the sound of a witch's anathemas in some unknown tongue. All right, so she would just scream and blurt out things and throw rocks, and Pearl would just be like, "Oh my gosh, this is this is like a witch child, um, just talking nonsense and gibberish, and throwing rocks." So it says the uh, the truth was that the little Puritans, being of the most intolerant brood that ever lived, had gotten a vague idea of something outlandish, unearthly, or at variance with ordinary fashion in the mother and child, and therefore scorned them with their hearts, and not unfrequently reviled them with their tongues. All right. So I think that's interesting. A little bit of commentary there on um, the Puritans being of the most intolerant brood that ever lived. Okay. Moving on, this is uh, the end of the par The end of the paragraph is begins at home, within, and around her. I'm going to read the last few sentences of that and into the paragraph that follows. She never created a friend, but seemed always to be sowing brought uh, to be. Sowing broadcast the dragon's teeth, whence sprung a harvest of armed enemies against whom she rushed to battle. So she never made any friends, but she would summon all of these things and pretend that she had friends. She had make-believe friends, but I mean, well, she didn't have make-believe friends. She only had make-believe enemies, all right? So, I never actually dreamed up friends for herself, only enemies for herself. It was inexpressibly sad. Uh, that when depth of sorrow to a mother who felt in her own heart the cause to observe in one so young this constant recognition of an adverse world and so fierce a training of the energies that were uh, to make good her cause in the uh, contest that must ensue. Gazing at Pearl, Hester Prynne often dropped her work upon her knees and cried out with an agony which she would fain have hidden. But... Uh, which made utterance for itself betwixt speech and groan. O oh, Father in heaven, if thou art still my father, what is this being which I have brought into the world? And Pearl, overhearing the ejaculations, or aware through some more subtle uh, uh, channel of the throbs of anguish, would turn her vivid and beautiful face upon her mother, smile with sprite-like intelligence, and resume her play. It's almost like Pearl understands that she is just this odd child. Almost takes pleasure in the in the torment that she might give her mother. I don't know. It's weird. Um, interesting too. At the bottom of page eighty, for me, you know that paragraph that says, you know, in the afternoon, it just mentions Pearl's black eyes. Ooh, you know, the eyes are the windows to the soul, right? Okay. Uh, and picking up right after that, uh, Pearl, I mean, Hester asked Pearl, Child, what art thou? cried the mother. Oh, I am your little Pearl, answered the child. But while she said it, Pearl laughed and began to dance up and down with the uh, humorsome gesticulation of a little imp whose next freak might be to fly up the chimney. Okay. Uh, bizarre behavior by this child, right? Art thou my child in very truth? asked Hester. Nor did she put the question altogether idly, but for the moment with a portion of genuine earnestness, for such was Pearl's wonderful intelligence that her mother half doubted whether she were not uh, acquainted with all the secret spell of her existence and might now reveal herself. Like, are you my child? Like, what the heck are you? Because you are so 
strange and you seem to know that you're strange and you seem to lean in to your strangeness that she's almost like maybe maybe this little spirit is going to you know show itself or or finally just say yes i am of the devil or whatever i don't know yes i am little pearl repeated the child uh, continuing her antics thou art not my child Thou art no pearl of mine, said the mother, half playfully, for it was often the case that a positive, that a sportive impulse came over her in the midst of her deepest suffering. Tell me then, what art thou, and who sent thee thither? Tell me, mother, said the child, seriously, coming up to Hester and pressing herself close to her knees. Do tell me. Thy heavenly father sent thee, answered Hester Pran. But she said it with a a hesitation that did not escape the acuteness of the child. Okay, so she's like, oh, the Heavenly Father sent thee. All right. Whether moved only by her ordinary freakishness or because an evil spirit prompted her, she put up her small forefinger and touched the scarlet letter. He did not send me, cried she positively. I have no Heavenly Father. Ooh. To say something like that, to utter something like that, in Puritan Boston, boy, howdy, that is saying a lot. Okay, so this pearl is an interesting sort, it would seem, and Hester doesn't know what to make of her. Hester loves her deeply, but is still wondering, what the heck did God give me? I don't know what to do. Okay, she seems a little out of her depth as far as taking care of this child. All right, not like she's getting a whole lot of help. Not like Pearl is having positive influences of any kind because she's, well, she doesn't have any influences of any kind because no one will, no one will have anything to do with her. So she's kind of just left to develop as she, as she develops. Interesting. All right. Well, there you go. Chapters four, five, and six. Thanks for paying attention. More to come. So stay tuned. And as always, happy reading.